All right. So welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you today and welcome to Dr. Losi, who's going to be presenting to us today. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that today is Earth Day. So happy Earth Day. Um, and this is such a great talk for us to be having this conversation um, on Earth Day. It's almost like we planned it this way. Um, but I think this will be really great. I also really want to acknowledge um, that I myself and much of the One Health and Wellness Office team live and work on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. So we want to recognize that relationship and reaffirm our relationship with one another, while also recognizing that we do have folks from all across Canada today joining us. So we want to recognize all treaty territories, territories and unceded territories um, across the nation. So today, um, I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Losey to you. Uh, he's an associate professor in the anthropology department at the University of Alberta, and he specializes in the archaeology of human-animal relationships, which I think is all of my favorite things in one job title, and I didn't even know it existed. So you're very lucky, Dr. Losey. I can't wait to hear about it. Um, and most of his work takes place in North America, but also in the Siberian Arctic and Eastern Russia. Um, and much of his work involves the study of dog and reindeer domestication. So maybe I'll touch a little bit on the reindeer side. I know we're focusing on dogs today, but maybe Dr. Losey can let us know how you ended up in dog and reindeer domestication there. Um, and also the history of dog sledding which is really interesting and really applicable to us here on the prairies. So uh, I really thank you, Dr. Losey, for taking some time to talk with us today and to share your insights. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time to ask you some questions at the end of your presentation. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box or the chat. I'll be watching that today. Um, and we will have the recording of this session available on our website so that you can share it with your contacts or maybe there's other trainers that you know who may be interested. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Losey. Great, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much for the, the opportunity to, um, to uh, present to your group today. Um, I don't have much here on uh, on reindeer, unfortunately, other than maybe the first slide here, which is my title slide, uh, where I have uh, this a picture of this wonderful dog. This is Ladak, who is a reindeer herding dog. Um, uh, that's part of a, a family that uh, my colleagues and I lived with for a month or so on the tundra of Siberia. Um, the, the family is a mobile. They live mobily with their reindeer herds and. This is their, their best dog, their, uh, their reindeer herding dog. Um, he's also very famous for chewing on power cords, uh, but he was also very affectionate and very smart dog. So uh, I can answer more questions later on about uh, reindeer herding uh, if you wish, but my topic for today is the deep history of the human dog bond, which is a topic I've been working on for about 10 years now. Um, primarily working on this topic in Siberia and very recently we've uh, somewhat shifted our focus over to the North American Arctic, um, working with Inuit communities uh, in particular to look at the recent and the very deep history of dog sledding, um, its history here, here in Canada, Alaska and in, in Eastern Russia. So uh, before I get into you know, our bonds with dogs, we first have to think about what a dog is, uh, where dogs come from, uh, and how we sort of know about this long-term history, our long-term history with dogs. So we start with the question, what is a dog? Well, a dog is a canid. It's, it's uh, part of the same uh, group of animals as wolves and foxes. Uh, coyotes, um, and you know, for an archaeologist, their bones, their their skeletal remains all look relatively the same, and that's because they're all very closely uh, related animals. All dogs, including um, indigenous dogs in the Americas, all dogs in Africa, Asia, Europe, and so on, all dogs originate from gray wolves. And those, the gray wolves that gave rise to all dogs um, are now 
uh, extinct except for the dogs that are with us today. So just like this very uh, silly uh, photo from National Geographic here shows uh, poodles, chihuahuas, Great Danes, Great Pyrenees, all of this huge diversity of dogs, they all have evolved from gray wolves. Every single type of dog that we have, not from uh, jackals or coyotes or, or even North American wolves, but gray wolves, particularly somewhere in Europe and Asia. So the question of where dogs come from is not very easy to answer. And there are many, many different uh, theories and ideas about where dogs originated. Um, the latest research, which was published, geez, was it just two or three months ago, suggests uh, using genetic data that the likely ancestors of all dogs uh, was perhaps located in Siberia. So gray wolves somewhere in the you know, boreal forest probably of Siberia. And based on kind of genetic clock information, those wolves seem to have uh, separated from other wolves in Europe and Asia by around 23,000 years ago, perhaps. This will probably be overturned five times in the next year as more genetic studies can't come out. But all the genetic evidence suggests dogs come from gray wolves somewhere in Europe or Asia. Um, archaeological dog remains, so dog skeletal remains, have been identified um, across this area. The oldest are still from uh, Europe. The, the oldest ones that everyone seems to agree on are about 15,000 years ago from a site called Bon Oberkassel in Germany. But we see here on the map here that um, from one end basically to the other of, of Europe and Asia, we see dogs by the end of the Ice Age, so at the end of the Pleistocene. So we see them in the Arctic, even in Karelia at about 10,900 years ago, just north of Mongolia about uh, 12,000 years ago, in the very high Arctic, um, which was originally part of the mainland before sea level rise, about 9,000 years ago. And just in the last month or two, um, reports uh, on genetic evidence from Alaska that shows dogs there about 10,000 years ago and slightly later, uh, south of Canada into Illinois, um, just under 10,000 years ago. So the oldest in Canada, not quite so old, but six, 7,000 years old, very, very clearly, and probably in Canada for at least 10,000 years, if not longer. So we have been living with dogs, um, you know, as, as, as humans for a really long period of time, since the Ice Age, when all humans on Earth were hunting and gathering, there was no agriculture. Dogs were the first domestic animals before there were sheep or goats living with us and certainly long before cattle or horses or, or, or even, even cats. Cats came along slightly, slightly later. So one of the really interesting ideas or proposal about how this relationship started is that many think that dogs perhaps chose to inhabit um, uh, human campsites, places that people were living. And, uh, you know, people at this period of time during the late Pleistocene were hunting, they were fishing, they were gathering plants. And of course, we had lots of waste around our, our settlements, food waste around our settlements. And the idea is that uh, a subset of wolves began to scavenge around human settlements, eating our leftovers. And those animals that were um, more kind of stress tolerant, had a shorter flight distance, they're in a sense friendlier, um, started to really specialize in the human niche. They became scavengers on our, our garbage piles. And then after they had become kind of a, a sort of separate population from other wolves, only then did people perhaps start uh, intentionally breeding them. This is a process that probably took thousands of years. The best sort of modern evidence for um, this sort of process comes from a very famous experiment that was conducted in um, the Soviet Union and now Russia uh, in and around Novosibirsk by a very famous scientist known as Belyaev. 
Belyev was interested in um, what might cause um, domestic mammals to have similar sorts of traits. So why would we see changes in the coat color of cattle and of horses and of dogs during the domestication process? Why do both a lot of dogs and a lot of pigs have floppy ears or curly tails? And his idea was essentially that these traits, which, which uh, Darwin and later scholars had, have talked about endlessly, which some people call the domestication syndrome, he argued that this kind of, um, these kind of traits emerged in uh, dogs and other animals simply because people selected for the friendliest animals. They bred friendly animal with friendly animal. They chased away or even killed unfriendly uh, animals. And this caused um, these traits to appear. So what he did in his experiment was he took um, a group of uh, these foxes, um, most of which came from actually a fur farm in Eastern Canada. And he conducted this very long-term experiment that lasted decades. So him and his, his research team would approach the foxes in their cages and then they would score them for friendliness. So if the foxes came up and approached the, the handler, um, you know, they seemed curious, they weren't terrified, they scored them as friendly. And if they, were, they, they ran to the back of the cage and hid, or if they tried to bite the, the handlers, they were scored as you know, very unfriendly. And then the only selection that they did is they bred friendly fox to friendly fox. And after 10 or 15 generations, a small number of the foxes began to develop uh, somewhat floppy ears. Some of them started to exhibit um, changes in their coat color. So if you look at the upper right hand corner, they had this kind of whitish patterns on their face. A few of them had upcurved tails. Some of them started to have uh, longer windows of socialization than uh, when they were really young animals uh, compared to the, the, the aggressive foxes. In other words, the, these foxes just by selecting for friendliness began to take on some of the developmental and um, uh, physical traits uh, that we see in many other domestic animals. It's not that people set out to create these kind of traits in domestic animals, but they are perhaps, perhaps arose through selection for friendliness. It's been called by many people one of the most ex important experiments ever conducted uh, regarding domestication. And if you'd like to read a very um, readable book about this, you can look at this, uh, this nice book, How to Tame a Fox, which you can, you can get through, um, through Amazon or your local bookstore in Saskatoon or wherever you're joining us from. So it's one of the theories potentially related to how dogs came to be with people. Now, once we start looking at uh, the later history of our relationship with dogs, we see lots of information or lots of, of patterns, if you will, that give us hints at the close bonds between people and dogs. And one of the best example of, examples of this is that we look at the genetics of ancient dogs, we can see in many cases that as people moved across continents, as people colonized new areas of the world, they traveled with their dogs. So a good example of this um, shown on the graph here, and this is, these are very busy graphs from the, the original publication, um, is Europe. So Europe had dogs at least 15,000 years ago. Uh, these were dogs that were kept by hunting and gathering peoples. And then seven, 8,000 years ago, agricultural people began to expand out of the Near East and move into Europe. And if we look at the genetics of the dogs uh, during this process, we can see that those agricultural groups moving into Europe uh, came with their dogs and those dogs intermixed with this, these pre-existing dog populations in Europe. And we see the same thing um, down into Africa, various waves into um, East Asia and Northern Asia, including into the Americas. So for example, in the Americas, um, we appear to see an early entry of dogs, perhaps um, around 15,000 years ago, with one of the first waves of you know, indigenous settlement of the Americas, 
people came came to this continent with their dogs. And um, all of the dogs, regardless of the different waves of settlement here, all of those dogs originated in Asia. There were later uh, movements of dogs into the Arctic, into the north of Canada, four or five, 6,000 years ago. There was a, a, a third migration of dogs into the Americas with the ancestors of the Inuit. Um, those, those people and their dogs came from around the Bering Strait area, moved uh, clear across Alaska, Canada, and into Greenland with their dogs. And then, of course, there were subsequent uh, movements of dogs in the Americas brought by um, European settlers and even probably by the Norse, although we have very little evidence for, for the Norse dogs, um, either archaeologically or genetically. So again, what we see with all this kind of genetic research is this just wave upon wave of movements of dogs and their people going very, very far back into time. And then, of course, those of us who love dogs and live with dogs can't imagine leaving them behind when we move. And, and of course, people were doing this a very long time ago. Another way we can kind of tease out um, some of the relationships uh, between very early people and their dogs is looking at dogs' diets. And we do this by um, extracting the protein from dog bones and looking at its kind of chemical composition, it's, it's isotopic composition. And, and for that, we look at nitrogen isotopes and carbon isotopes. And basically what this allows us to see is dogs or people's position within a food chain. So if we look at this really simple graph here, we, and you look at the center of the graph and you see the, the big, bigger fish, the salmon, so here the seal is eating the salmon. So the seal's nitrogen values are somewhat raised above that of the salmon. Um, or with the, with the wolf here on the left, it would eat primarily herbivores. So it's, it's, uh, its nitrogen values are higher than what it ate. And they're also shifted slightly to the right on the carbon scale uh, in relationship to what they eat. And with this kind of information, which is too technical to worry about here, um, but what we can see is things like the relative proportions of different types of, of food items in the, in the diet. How much marine foods animals were eating or people were eating, how much um, you know, terrestrial ungulates they might have been eating, things like deer, um, how, many, uh, how much plants like corn um, were, were in the diet and so on. Some of these foods have very distinct isotopic signatures. So we can tease out what dogs or people were eating. So one of the really interesting things about this research is that almost everywhere people have looked, the isotope values of ancient dogs, they are very, very close to the isotope uh, values of the people that they lived with. And this is because dogs and people are sharing meals. They are generally eating the same types of food during their lives. So here's an example of this kind of work um, that, that I've done. This is a, a burial of a, dog, of a dog in the Russian Arctic. Um, it was buried in, in, the, in the ground, in this ground froze shortly after the dog was buried. And we find even pieces of the hair of the dog still with the skeleton. You, you probably can't see it here on the, on the photograph, but even the dog's toenails were preserved. So we analyzed the isotope values of the dog's bone. Those reflect a few years of the dog's life. We analyzed the isotope values of its hair. Those give us a few months of life. We analyzed the, to the toenails that give us, you know, maybe a few weeks. And then we can even analyze its teeth, which give us, you know, the teeth form at different periods of the dog's early life. And what we could see with all of this is this particular dog was being fed fish, fish, fish all throughout its life, regardless of whether we were analy analyzing the hair or the teeth or the bone or, or, or whatever, which is really interesting because the particular area in which this dog was buried, and it's buried right at the Arctic Circle, only has really fish available for about six months of the year. This is along the Ob River. It freezes over, it becomes depleted in oxygen, and the fish flee this area. What this means clearly is that people were fishing during the 
this uh, period of the year when fish were available, they were using those fish to feed their dogs, and they were probably also storing some of that fish to feed the dogs in the kind of non-fish period, the winter period in this part of, art of the world. So again, it's, it's a dietary relationship, but it shows that people are making efforts and probably a lot of efforts to provision their dogs to feed them uh, throughout the course of their lives. Now, one other interesting thing that has been um, documented in uh, regarding dog diets uh, relates to dogs' ability to digest starches. So starches uh, overall become important in, for human diets largely when people start um, raising crops. So once we see agriculture develop, you know, starting around 10,000 years ago, but really becoming prominent seven, 8,000 years ago, starches become important for people. But wolves and other um, canids like coyotes and so on, really don't have much of an ability to digest starches. They're carnivores. They have evolved to, to process um, meat in their diet and bone marrow and other things, but they're, they're, they're carnivorous animals. So if you look at this very complicated and overly busy figure I have here, you see other canids and wolves on the left. And this graph shows the number of a particular gene that they have. And that gene um, is correlated with uh, animal uh, canids' abilities to digest starches. So those num the numbers of those genes in wolves and other canids are very, very low because they don't eat, the eat these foods. And on the far right, we have modern dogs. Many modern dogs have very high counts of this uh, particular gene because over the long term, they've developed the ability to digest starches. And this center bit of dots here are archeological dog remains where DNA has been extracted and they've looked for the presence of this particular gene. What this graph shows, and I know it's impossible to see here is that that um, high copy numbers of those genes appear only about seven or 8,000 years ago, after dogs had been living in agricultural communities for a few thousand years, they started to also develop high copy numbers of this gene, meaning in all likelihood that those dogs were eating a lot of agricultural byproducts, probably waste grains, uh, things like this, or perhaps, um, um, something cooked with those grains, some sort of uh, leftover materials that people have that they're presenting to their dogs. But here we really see the, the, the genetic makeup of dogs changing to allow them to cohabit uh, with people, to live together with people, and really focus on something that their evolution up to this point had not prepared them for, eating lots of starches, because that's what people were eating. Okay, now one of the more challenging uh, topics to think about in terms of um, human dog relationships is when we see animals that suffered injuries. So we could look at this kind of evidence in the skeleton and think, well, maybe the dog survived the injury and this is indication that people were caring for the dog, which could be true. Alternatively, we might see injuries on dogs and think that they were caused by humans, perhaps indicating um, abuse or efforts to, to try to kill the, the animal. So to show you one of these kind of confusing cases, uh, this is a dog from the kind of Central Asian uh, region where the societies these dogs were living in were, they were pastoral groups, they kept cattle, horses, sheep and goats, they raised crops and so on. And this particular dog was buried. Its whole body was placed in a pit near a mound um, where people were buried, which is interesting in and of itself. But when we looked at this dog carefully, and if you look at the right-hand photo here, you can see that there uh, are very big differences between the right and the left femurs of this, of this dog. So this is the dog's hind limb and uh, the upper bone in their hind limb. So the, the left femur was broken right through its middle. This dog broke its leg, but that uh, fracture healed 
And but when it healed, it healed completely out of alignment, right? It's 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 angled. It should be straight, like the femur on the left. It's it's left femur. But it's also interesting to see here that uh, the state of the left femur. So this leg, when it was broken, and probably throughout much of its healing processes, and maybe even after it was healed, was probably a non-functional leg. It was a three-legged dog. And if we look at the head of the femur, this is the, the part of the femur that fits into the socket in the pelvis of the dog, we can see that it's extremely worn. And this is probably because the, the, all of the weight from the hind limb was transferred onto the one leg. That one leg was carrying the dog as it hopped around on three legs during the course of its life. So when we look at this, perhaps this means that dog broke its leg in some sort of accident and was being cared for by people. Alternatively, perhaps the dog was struck by people and that's how it broke its leg. We have no way to really, really tell that. But probably uh, the, the best indicator uh, in all of the archeological record and in regards to this dog, that people really had close bonds with their dogs is that in many cases, people buried their dogs when they died. And this is a topic that I've been working on for quite a long time. Uh, I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, another area of research that we've just been starting and that we actually do in collaboration with some folks at the University of Saskatch Saskatchewan is trying to understand dogs' working lives. Um, and most of these dogs that we've been looking at were probably involved in uh, hunting or herding or pulling sleds or providing protection for people, um, uh, and of course, also companionship. But these were probably, you know, what we call today working dogs. They were dogs that shared people's daily tasks with them. So um, we are, of course, interested in trying to really figure out or understand those working lives to try to tease them apart and be able to demonstrate um, by looking at the bodies of the dogs, evidence for their specific form of working life. So here is, here's an example of, of a, a dog actually in Saskatchewan that was part of an experiment um, using uh, a traditional indigenous transport method called travois, which is an A-shaped frame of wood that's connected with some straps to the back of a dog and people put weight on, uh, weights on these and then the dog would pull this load um, as people moved about the landscape. The same technology was eventually transferred into um, uh, for use with a horse. And the, again, this, this kind of way of working with dogs is probably thousands of years old, but we really have very, very poor evidence for it archeologically. Um, one of the areas that we have been just recently spending a lot of time trying to explore is um, dog sledding. So this can be approached in many different ways, uh, one of which is to look at the um, remains of sleds themselves in the Arctic, or perhaps even images of, of dogs pulling sleds. So we start to see fairly complex sleds uh, in the Arctic starting around 2000 years ago. So these sled parts you see on the right show up about 2,200 years ago in Alaska by about 2,000 years ago. In parts of the Siberian Arctic around the same time period, this knife handle was found. And if you look at it very closely, you can see it sort of looks like a dog and it sort of has some sort of bands on its side that may represent a harness. So perhaps, and just perhaps, this may be evidence of, uh, uh, of the emergence of dog sledding. But we'd like to get into this a bit more and try to um, come up with more conclusive evidence that will show us the long-term history of dog sledding. Um, looking more closely, we see things across um, both the Canadian Arctic, Alaska, and parts of Russia of these, these swivels. They also become abundant about uh, around 2,000 years ago. Um, one particular site we've been working on called Uspalui has about 266 of these objects in it. And these are very, very similar to swivels that are used historically in parts of the Arctic as parts of uh, harnesses. They prevent uh, the harness traces, the, the lines that go from the harness back to the, the sled from being twisted up 
you know, they, they twist and turn so those, those bands don't twist and break or, or become a mess as people are, are traveling with the dogs. But we're also interested in this um, skeletally, trying to figure out how, if we just have a dog's body, we might be able to figure out if they were, were actually involved in uh, dog sledding. So to do this, we're actually looking at uh, the skeletons of dogs from museums, including the skeletons of um, early uh, Inuit um, sled dogs. So we're comparing the, the skeletons uh, to look at how the, the, the skeletal system responds to all of the exercise, the strain and stress of pulling sleds. A sled dog is like, it is an athlete. And like any long distance running athlete, though that kind of activity is going to, of course, affect the muscles of the dog, but that it's also going to affect the strength of the skeleton itself. So we're expecting to see um, basically dog skeletons that are more robust, they're stronger, and perhaps slightly different shaped than our dogs that were, than dogs that were not pulling sleds that were used for hunting or that were companion animals and so on. Uh, we don't have results to show you yet, uh, but this work is, is currently underway and hopefully in the next six months or so we'll start to get um, some results. So finally, to turn to what is perhaps, in my opinion, the single best form of evidence for people's close bonds with dogs, and that is the intentional burial of dogs at their death. So if we look across the planet, dogs are the first animal that are intentionally buried by people, and they are the animal most commonly buried globally in prehistory. So we see dogs archeologically that are buried on every continent. We see dogs that are buried very shortly after um, they were first domesticated. So for example, the earliest dog burial in the world actually dates to about 15,000 years ago. And that was at this site known as uh, Bonn Overcastle in Germany. This uh, particular dog was quite young when it died. Um, it was placed in a grave with several people. Um, so it was a, a, a combined burial of people and this particular dog. And this particular dog appears to have been quite sick. It has all of these disruptions in the formation of, its, of the enamel in its teeth which the investigators argue was potentially caused by morbillivirus or, or distemper or a form of something very similar that repeatedly affected the dog, stressed its body, and disturbed uh, the formation of its teeth. It's very, very interesting. Uh, the cause of these, these hypoplastic lesions on the teeth is a bit debated, but nonetheless, it's clearly the burial of a dog 15,000 years ago, which is in itself quite amazing. In my own work, I've been able to show that not only were dogs buried in many cases, but dogs were oftentimes treated like non-human forms of persons when they died. And the best evidence for this, in my opinion, comes from Southern Siberia. Here we have multiple examples of dogs that lived to quite old ages. And when those dogs passed away, they were taken to special spots on the landscape um, where people were buried. These are not areas where, where uh, people were living on a day-to-day -day basis. They were, they were reserved, they were cemeteries, formal cemeteries. And the dogs were buried just like people. So if we look at the, the photo in the upper left-hand corner, this is about, uh, this dog dates to about 7,000 years ago. It was placed in a pit. Um, it was buried with a, uh, a very large spoon carved from antler. Uh, the illustration on the right is one of my favorites. This dog, again, is, dates between about seven and 8,000 years ago. It was placed in a very large grave with uh, several antlers, other parts of animal remains. And really interestingly, it was buried wearing a necklace. So the necklace consists of four teeth. And these were the, some of the front teeth from an elk uh, that were drilled 
you know, put onto a, a, a strap and then placed around the dog's neck. So these dogs, and, and the, the interesting thing about all of these different types of graves for dogs, all of which are three, 4,000 years old or older, is that the, the way in which these dogs is, are buried is exactly the same way in which people are buried in these same cemeteries. People are giving these dogs funerals when they die. And to me, this is just the, the best form of evidence that we can have that people really considered these dogs as being um, you know, parts of their society, parts of their family. And when they passed away, they treated them like the human dead. They, they sent them to the afterlife using the same rites and same rituals as they did with, with their human kin, which I think is, is a remarkable story and a beautiful story that shows really clear evidence of our, our longstanding bonds with dogs. And of course, um, these bonds continue today. Uh, many of us love our dogs. And when I do this work, um, it always makes me think about my own dog who is included in the picture here. This is Guinness. She is now uh, 14 years old. It's been with me a long time. Um, I hate to think of, of losing her, but she is definitely um, you know, part of my group and a, a special dog person to me. And, and I'm sure many of you have similar relationships with, with your own dogs or cats or other animals. Um, and in a sense, it's very unsurprising to see that these kind of emotional bonds with animals uh, have a history that we can trace back perhaps um, 15,000 years, if not uh, further back in time than that. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions about my presentation, um, I, I would happily answer them now. You can also email me um, at the address listed here on the page if you have questions, and I'm happy to share with you any of the literature um, that I presented in today's paper so that you can see the, the real science itself rather than my um, general overview of that work. So thank you very much uh, for your time.